Yes. All right. Uh, okay. So in chapter six, let's uh, go back to chapter seven. So chapter seven has two parts. So the first part is about bond uh, calculations. So basically, bond calculations are time value of money, annuity calculation plus one lump sum payment. So you use future value. Uh, you use uh, in bond cal calculation, par value works like a future value because you, if you buy a bond, you receive par value in the future date. So par, you use par value to find the future value. So if nothing is returned, assume the par value is $1,000. That's the norm in bond calculation. And also, um, so there are five variables, time value of money variables. So future value, present value, payment, interest rate, and number of periods. So future value is par and present value is what? Bond price. And uh, payment is related to what? Coupon rate. So you use a coupon rate to find the payment because coupon is the regular payment you are will be getting when if you buy a bond. So coupon rate is related to payment and interest rate. The discount rate is related to what feature of bond yield to maturity. So yield to maturity is the discount rate and uh, but remaining uh, number of period is related to the remaining time until maturity. So when you do the bond calculations, sign conventions matter. Otherwise, Excel or financial calculator will give an error message. So you need to follow the sign convention. Payment and future value you receive. So those are positive and bond price you pay. So, and also another important uh, thing you should remember when you do the bond calculation is semi-annual. So if the bond is paying semi, making semi-annual payments, remember quoted rates are all annual. Yield to maturity, if, you, if someone says yield to maturity of this bond is uh, 5%, that's annual rate. So when you do the calculation, if the bond is paying semi-annual coupon, you should make everything semi-annual. So payment is for semi-annual, uh, coupon payment is semi-annual, and you need to enter semi-annual rate, not the annual rate. So a number of periods should also be such as, uh, adjusted. So if you are looking at a five-year bond, a, five, five, uh, a bond that has a remaining uh, five, five years remaining until maturity, but if it's a semi-annual bond, you should use 10, not five, as the number of periods, because there are 10 semi-annual periods in uh, five years. So you remember those two things, semi-annual adjustment, if it's a semi-annual bond, and sign convention, so you must uh, remember those when you do bond calculations. So that's the first part. So if you remember those uh, things clearly, and then you also must practice. It's very easy to make mistakes. And so you must practice. So sometimes at the beginning, you, 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 will make, you may make mistakes. So that's why there are many. From slide one to... Uh, slide 16, slide 17, so that's the first part. So there are many uh, numerical examples and spreadsheet embedded as well as it, uh, Connect has many practice problems. So that's why a homework assignment problems. So you practice there and if you need to make a mistake, uh, make, mis make a mistake there. And then you need to be uh, 
you need to be uh, an expert of that area to do well in the exam next week. So that's all about bond calculation. So any questions about bond calculation? So if you need the extra help, I have an office hour from one to three today. So come, come to the office hour if you need uh, an extra help, okay? So I assume that nobody is asking any questions. So I assume that you are okay with the bond um, calculation part. And then we, let's move on to the second part of the uh, Bond, this bond chapter. The second part is about mainly about concepts related to the bond market. And these concepts are also closely related to the calculation you learned in the first part. So after you do a calculation, you should have also, a, you should sit down after doing the calculation and you should sit down and look, examine the numbers you got and do, are those numbers making sense or not? So for example, when you uh, calculate the bond price and bond price is lower than $1,000, so that's a discount bond, then you need to check before submitting your answer, you need to check, oh, bond price is lower than $1,000. So that's a discount bond. So coupon rate must be lower than the yield, is it? If not, something is wrong. So you need to always check if your uh, calculation makes sense using your knowledge. And I told you every bond has interest rate risk, but some bonds have more interest rate risk than other bonds. So there are two characteristics you learned that affect uh, the interest rate risk of a bond. So which one, so those, what are those two characteristics? Maturity. So that's one characteristic. The other characteristic is what? Coupon rate. So what kind of bonds have more interest rate risk than other bonds? Longer term bonds and lower coupon rate bonds have more interest rate risk. So why? Because interest rate risk is caused by when yield goes up, Present value goes down. You're so gonna, you're gonna tell me shit. Listen, suck my yield shut up. up. Listen to me. Suck my bond price goes man. up. Listen. Vice versa. When yield goes down, bond price go up. So, because yield is the discount rate and yield is the market rate and market rate fluctuates. So, for example, during the COVID crisis, government Fed, yes, federal government, Federal Reserve. Um, push the interest rate down. Why? To boost the economy, to fight against the, the crisis, uh, health crisis, pandemic that's spreading to the entire economy. So uh, to help the economy functioning better during the pandemic, what Fed did is giving stimulus as well as lowering the fiscal policy as well as monetary policy, pushing interest rate down. Discount rate goes down, asset value goes up. So stock market goes up, bond prices go up. So interest rates affect asset prices. Yeah, Christian's question, do we, um, yeah, Christian asked, uh, do we always have to convert Right, there is a student, so I am Yeah, good question. So uh, I, I recommend you use decimal because uh, uh, so that's, it's very easy to make mistakes. So in calculators, definitely you must use percent. So that's a cal calculator. If you're using BA2 plus financial calculator, Calculators uh, require percent input. But when you use Excel, you may yeah, make the cell accept the percentage, uh, but you need to be careful. So you need to uh, check. So I, my habit, I always use decimal. And uh, if not, when, when I'm using percentage, I carefully check uh, if the check uh, cell is set 
to accept percentage. Yeah. So, and in the other calculations uh, later, like in chapter 10 and 11, you, are, you will be learning regarding risk return trade off. Again, this percentage decimal issue will come out. So, in there, percentage yeah, using decimal is a lot more, um, a lot easier. But it's a personal preference. But my point is, you should be consistent. So if you are using percentage, you should use percentage throughout the old calculations. Otherwise, you mess up. Like, for example, you use yield maturity decimal, but coupon rate percentage, you will easily make mistakes. So try to be, cons you should be consistent. And that's why you need to practice, practice many times to make sure that kind of small details uh, uh, causes an error, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's a usual. When you first learn time value of money calculations, making small errors uh, leading to uh, huge problems. So that's why you need to practice, practice before the exam. Any other questions, right? Yeah, yes, decimal is here. That's what I find too, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, if you don't have any other questions, yeah, let's continue. So after you master bond calculations and the theory behind behind it, let's uh, broaden our scope. Let's broaden our scope and think about why are we are we learning this kind of bond calculation. Remember, this class is about making financial management decisions in a corporation. So why do corporations need bonds? They, need, they Many corporations sell bonds, issue bonds. Why? To raise capital, borrow. So corporations this is what raise capital from investors, the UCF can be either stockholders or bondholders. So in the corporations so raise capital the, out of the stock uh, market or the, the bond market or going to bank. To raise capital and invest those capital in uh, assets. It can be either physical assets like factory, equipment, or uh, intangible assets like patents, R&D, human capital, software engineers. So they, companies need capital or buying land or building. So corporations need to raise capital and invest in assets and then make products or provide the services and generate revenue and pay make interest payment to bondholders and the remainder goes and paying tax so everything paid out and what's remaining at the end that's profit net income so that net income what happens to net income either paid out as dividend to the stockholders or and usually companies do not pay everything as dividend so some part is uh, uh, paid out so that's a paid out ratio and the remainder is a retention ratio so the those retained earnings return to the company and increase the equity value of the firm so that's how it works so in that kind of context uh, try to fit this bond theory to that kind of overall big picture so that's why in this slide we have the difference be between stocks and bonds so what are the differences between uh yeah so when companies just uh, raise capital what are the differences between uh, issuing bonds to raise capital versus issuing stocks to raise capital? So the good thing is in this class, uh, you learn corporate finance problem. So that means uh, how do companies make decisions, financial management decisions? So capital structure decision is also a financial management decision. Well, it's a, a, Financial man management decisions of corporations have many types. One of them, one of the important financial management decisions are about 
debt or equity that we call capital structure decision. So for example, if a company needs to raise $100 million for a new uh, plant, they uh, want to build in Texas, for example. So because of Trump administration's emphasis on domestic, US domestic production, for example, so this company decides to build a, a plant in Texas in addition to their existing plant in China, for example. Then how to support that 100 million project? The company needs money to, needs to raise $100 million for the new plant. Either the, whether the company uh, sell bonds to raise capital or sell equity, sell stocks. So that's an important thing. Uh, important concept, the difference between debt and equity. So corporations need to understand the differences. That's why you need you learn it in this corporate finance class. But in the flip side, when you understand the difference between debt and equity from financial management manager's point of view, the same point of view, same, same knowledge is useful for investors. So from investors' point of view on Wall Street, if I have $100,000, shall I buy the bond of the, that, bond, that company or a stock of the company? So do you want to buy Apple stock do you, or do you want to buy Apple bond? So that kind of knowledge, debt versus equity knowledge is also helpful for investors. So those students, I think probably most of the accounting and finance students all finance students and most accounting students must take investment class. So investment class is about uh, learning what kind, investing in which type of security, stocks or bonds. So my point is the knowledge you learn in corporate finance class is like this. Also, it will like be very useful in investment courses because um, when we so look at the same problem from the financial manager's point of view, that is selling bonds or selling stock. And from investor's point of view, buying stocks or buying bonds. So same problem same knowledge helps making decisions for both companies and investors so buying that debt versus equity so simple example whether you you if you have have one hundred thousand dollars you may uh you uh use that hundred thousand dollar to buy apple stock or you can buy Apple bonds. So what are the differences? So buying bonds, if you buy a bond, you do not become an owner. But if you buy an Apple stock, you become an owner, shareholder. So, and when Apple makes important decisions, the bondholders are, do not vote for the important decisions because bondholders are not owners. So they don't have voting rights, but stock, common stockholders have voting rights, but preferred stockholders don't have, usually have voting rights, but that preferred stockholder versus common stockholder, that's the topic for the next chapter, chapter eight. So after, right after the midterm exam, you will learn more details about stocks. But here, just simply stock versus bond. Bond holders don't have voting rights, but common stockholders have voting rights. And from the comp issuing company's point of view, when companies sell uh, bonds, so companies need to make interest payment. Interest payment is tax deductible. So from the point of view, for, from from the point of how tax liability, which one is better, selling bond versus selling stock? Definitely using uh, bond to raise capital is better because interest payment is tax deductible. IRS gives uh, fair uh, gives um, make 
uh, IRS, the IRS let companies uh, deduct uh, interest payment from taxable income, but dividend payment is not. Dividend payment is payment to the owners, and so dividend payment is not tax deductible. Dividend payment does not reduce taxable income. And another worst thing about, uh, another bad thing about um, a dividend and tax is corporations are subject to double taxation. So corporations are uh, a separate legal entity, and that as you learned in chapter one, corporations pay tax. And so net income and dividends in stockholders receive is after the tax payment, but still stockholders, when they receive, receive dividend, that's also subject to personal income tax. So that means stockholders are subject to double taxation, one tax based on uh, in the corporate level, and then personal so double taxation is a huge, huge disadvantage for corporations. So, so my point is, when you learn this new concept, try to relate what you learned in the uh, in the previous chapters to make it whole. So, remember, the goal of this class is to help you learn how to make good decisions for corporations. And when companies make uh, interest payment, uh, if companies cannot make interest payment or paying back debt, that's a trouble. So creditors can bring this case to the bankruptcy court, but uh, stockholders cannot do that because dividends are not a liability of a company until the dividend is declared. So stockholders do not have a legal recourse, um, uh, re legal tools, even, even though uh, dividends are not paid, but uh, bondholders can bring the case to the bond, uh, bankruptcy uh, court if they do not receive interest payment or a principal payment. But so far, based on what you learned, you may think, oh, it's good to have a lot of that instead of uh, raising capital from the stock market, but not necessarily. So, or, so a, a good amount of that is helpful because of tax advantage and, uh, and also another thing is which, which capital is more expensive. So from the company's point of view, capital is not free. There are costs. So investors are requiring a uh, higher return on risky investment. So from, uh, that's, from investors' point of view, that's rate of return. And the same rate of return investors earn, that's the cost of that capital from the company's point of view. So that's the same thing. So for example, investors require to earn 8% interest rate on an investment means that investors apply 8% discount rate for when they do the valuation. So that means that cost of that capital is 8%. So who pays that 8%? issuing company. So from invest, this 8% is, is uh, expected return from the investor's point of view, but from the issuing company's point of view, 8% is the cost of that capital. So which capital is more expensive? Debt capital for, or equity capital from the company's point of view? I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it. So anyone? Which capital is more expensive from the company's point of view? So which investor will require higher return? Stockholders or bondholders? Definitely stockholders. So expected return on stocks for the same company definitely much higher than expected return on bonds for the same company. Why? Because stocks are riskier. 
So stockholders are residual claimants. That means that everyone gets paid. So bondholders always get paid first. So that's why bond is a lot safer than stocks. So that's why stockholders demand a lot higher return. So that means for the same amount of cash flow, expected cash flow, discount rate is higher. That's why present value price is lower. So that's why a lot of people are excited about the stock market because on average stocks pay higher return than bonds. But it, because of good reasons, stocks are a lot more riskier than bonds. So, so from the company's point of view, bonds have a lower cost. To, so, and also there is a benefit of interest in terms of taxes, but still. Uh, so, so having a reasonable amount of debt is good, but having too much debt means a big uh, trouble. So that's if a company has too much debt, recession hits, those companies are very vulnerable because uh, during, a recession, during a recession, business will slow down and a company with a lot of debt will be able to uh, make interest payments and principal payments to bondholders and then the, uh, the creditors will bring the case to the bankruptcy court. So stockholders will lose everything in that kind of situation. So that's what I mentioned here. Excess debt can lead to financial distress and bankruptcy. But theoretically, all liquidity comes cannot go bankrupt because there is no debt, no creditors, and stockholders cannot uh, make the uh, company uh, declare bankruptcy because stock dividends are not um, liability. So these kind of differences are important. All right. Also bond is, is a bond features so watch so bond is a basically a contract bonds are a contract between issuing company and uh, bond holders. So What's the name of the contract document? It's called indenture. And the contract document should include the basic terms of the bonds and how many bonds are issued. And is there any security collateral? And is there a call provision? Or are there uh, provisions to protect uh, bondholders? So those are called the protective covenants. And some bonds have a uh, secured by collateral. Good example is a mortgage. But there are uh, bonds, unsecured bonds, meaning that um, no collateral. So long-term unsecured bonds are called the debentures. And, short, and relatively short-term uh, bonds, unsecured are notes. And watch the cutoff, 10 years. So, uh, long-term bonds, maturity longer than 10 years, and if those bond, long-term bonds are unsecured, we call them debentures, and <clears throat> like a relatively shorter term, meaning that maturity, original maturity less than 10 years, unsecured, those are called notes. So that's why if you hear treasury notes, means treasury uh, you, uh, the bond issued by tre the US Treasury Department original maturity less than 10 years we call them uh, notes treasury notes so you should also think about the relationship between bond characteristics and required return on bond so what kind of bonds have a higher yield, meaning that what kind of uh, you know, features make investors require higher return? So definitely debentures are unsecured. So investors would require a higher return. So yield will be higher, all else equal. 
And if the debenture is subordinated, that means lower in seniority in payment. So subordinated debentures are worst. Yeah, so investors would require higher yield. That means price will be a lot lower than other bonds. And callable bonds can be called by a company. So in what kind of company situation, companies would like to exercise the call provision if the bond has a call provision. So bonds that have a call provision is called callable bonds. Not all bonds have are callable. Most bonds are not callable, but there are some callable bonds. So callable bonds, if a bond is callable, that call provision should be written where? Indenture. In the bond indenture, the contract document, it should clearly show the call provision. So if a company issued a callable bond, in what kind of situation? The company wants to exercise the call provision to, to call the bond. When market rates go down, what happens? When market rates go down, bond price go up. So the, the uh, company will regret, oh, if I waited, if we, we waited, we should, we would have issued a bond with at a much lower interest rate, but we paid too much. But take a closer look at it. We have a call provision, that means we, we, we can exercise the call provision and there is a call price usually higher than the face value. So we can pay the call price to the bondholders and call the bond back. So usually call provision, like let's say the call provision shows the call price is at 1,050. And then uh, market rates go down and market uh, bond price goes above 1050, let's say 1080, market price of a bond is 1080, but the call provision shows the companies can uh, call the bond paying 1050 call price. Then the company will exercise the call, of, uh, call pr uh, provision and then buy the bond at 1050. So investors must, bondholders must sell the bond at 1050, even though market price is 1080. So that's the nature of a, a callable bond. So callable bond versus regular bond, which one has a higher yield, should they have a higher yield? So investors would require definitely a higher yield on callable bonds versus the regular bond. So you need to understand this kind of theory as well. And the next slide shows corporate bond ratings. So, so far, what you have learned from uh, slide one to slide 21 applies to all bonds, government bonds, corporate bonds, municipal bonds, every bond. But slide 22 and 23, bond ratings are mainly for um, uh, bonds that have credit risk, like corporate bonds. So, so bond issuers, what if bond issuers can go bankrupt? So we don't think uh, US federal government uh, will go bankrupt, at least in a short term. So when you look at treasuries, uh, we don't worry about uh, bond ratings. But when we look at corporate bonds or municipal bonds or foreign government bonds like issued by Greece, or Mexico, Argentina. So when then we need to worry about bond rating. So what's the probability of the bond issuer declare bankruptcy? So there are rating agencies like Moody's and Standard Poor's and Fitch. Those companies evaluate the quality of the issuer's credit and finance, and then they give ratings. So AAA is the best rating, and B is the lowest of investment grade, and below B is junk bond and high yield bond. So junk bonds below B definitely yield is much higher than 
uh, investment grade bonds because investors will require higher yield and you know higher yield means higher discount rate so that means lower price so that's why junk bond price will be a lot lower for the same amount of coupon because those coupon payments are risky so present value is a lot lower so that's why junk bond price is a lot lower because yield discount rate is higher compared to investment credit bonds and this bond rating keeps changing market rate keep changing and the company's business changes. So even if you purchase a, a investment grade bond, but the next day, the rating may drop sharply if there's something bad happens to the company or the economy, uh, yield and price fluctuate every day. So even if you invested an investment grade bond, there is a risk of downgrade because by definition, you are investing in a risky asset. And when the market condition changes frequently, rating agency update the grading. And the next slide shows government bonds. So treasury bonds, have, treasury department issues three types of securities, tre treasury bills, original maturity one year or less, and treasury notes one to 10 years, treasury bonds, uh, original maturity longer than 10 years, and treasury bonds and notes pay coupons, but treasury bills are pure discount loans. So in addition to US federal government, there are agency bonds. So federal agencies like Fannie, Freddie, that kind of mortgage related agencies sell bonds. And also states and cities like the, the New York state and the city of New York, those kind of governments, local governments and state governments, they borrow and one specific uh, one the most important thing you uh, know about the municipal bonds is when investors buy municipal bonds issued by let's say new if you buy a, a bond issued by the state of new york you your interest payment is uh, exempt at the uh, uh, federal level. So in the federal income tax, when you file federal income tax, uh, you don't pay tax for uh, the coupons, interest payment you receive from the federal government. And for the issuing state, you can also uh, get the state and local income tax as well. But if you, for example, purchase a uh, uh, municipal bond issued by the state of uh, New Jersey, but you live in New York, then that kind of uh, local uh, uh, tax benefit you, you cannot get. But at the federal uh, tax income tax level, municipal bonds provide always provide a, a tax benefit. So interest received from the treasury is tax exempt at the federal income tax level. So that's the most important thing you need to remember about municipal bonds. So here is an example. So based on this concept, there is an important topic like equivalent taxable yield. So this example shows that 8% corporate bond is equivalent to 4.8% yield municipal bond for uh, an investor whose tax bracket is 40%. So this A, what do we call this 8%? 8% is the equivalent taxable yield of a municipal bond with a yield of 4.8% for the investor who has a tax bracket of 40%. But this equivalent taxable yield is different. This, this relationship changes depending on the tax rate of the investor. So for example, if uh, we are looking at an investor whose tax bracket is 25%, then these to this investor, 
6% municipal bond is equivalent to 8% corporate bond. So in other words, what kind of so what kind of investor would be more attracted to municipal bonds? Very wealthy investors with a, that who has a very high tax rate or uh, investors who have a relatively lower tax rate. So who's going to be more attracted, more interested in municipal bonds? Yeah, thank you, Philip. So definitely uh, high net worth investors who have a high tax rate will definitely be more in, interested in municipal bonds because the tax benefit is much higher to them. Right? And municipal bonds uh, tax benefit definitely helps municipal governments like states and local governments to raise capital at a lower cost because municipal bonds ha has a higher, uh, e uh, has a lower yield because after tax, uh, it's, it, uh, uh, investors would always compare bonds based on after tax basis. So even though municipal bonds look for, for example, in the here, if you you are your tax bracket is twenty five percent, that means eight percent corporate bond and six percent municipal bonds are equivalent. So that means if you are looking at a municipal bond that's paying six point five percent, and you are comparing with eight percent corporate bond, so let's say, oh, which bond I need to buy? My tax bracket is twenty five percent. And let's say Target is selling a bond and that uh, um, yield is 8%, but New York City is selling a bond, yield is 6.5%. So if you don't have enough knowledge, 8% bond looks better, but actually 6.5% New York City bond is better because of this tax benefit. So in other words, this uh, tax benefit helps local, gov uh, uh, local government and states raise capital at a lower cost, right? Any questions so far? Next. So zero coupon bonds like treasury bills don't pay coupons. So that means coupon rate is zero. So yield on a bond usually Above zero, we are not living in a net minus lay rate environment. So usually nominal rate we observe is always it's, it's very small in this low rate environment, but we don't see negative rate. So that means market rates are always above zero, at least zero. So zero coupon bonds, coupon rate is always lower than yield. So what does that tell you? Coupon rate is lower than yield. Oh, that means discount bonds. So that's why zero coupon bonds are pure discount bonds, always traded at a discount. Any questions so far? All right. So the next slide shows you uh, floating rate bonds. So there are exceptions. So float, floating rate bonds. So if, if nothing is written, assume that all bonds have a fixed coupon rate. So that's the norm. But there are some exceptions. Coupon rates of a bond fluctuate, changes. Those are called floating rate bonds. So usually those uh, fluctuations are tied to some market rate. So a good example of this kind of debt is adjustable rate mortgage. Like, and uh, you may, uh, if you purchased a, a house in the past, you might have heard about this, like a five-year arm instead of 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So 30-year or 15-year fixed rate mortgages are most popular in the mortgages market, but some people use five-year arms. So that means for five years, interest rate is fixed, but 
after that adjusted rate mortgage, adjusted uh, rates are adjusted. So that's why we call it five-year ARM, A-R-M, adjustable rate mortgage. So that's a good example of floating rate loans. Right? But this is uh, some special type. And there are some other types of bonds, catastrophe bonds, income bonds, convertible bonds, put bonds. So catastrophe bonds are usually is issued by insurance companies. So for example, uh, uh, you have, if you are working for uh, an insurance company that specializes in flood insurance, and then if a flood hits the, the area, the company will lose a lot. So to be prepared for that kind of situation, insurance companies sell catastrophe bonds and the, catast the indenture of the bonds include provisions like if a certain level of hurricane hits the area, we will not pay. A coupon, something like that. So that's an example of catastrophe bond. But if that's the case, hurricane hits the insurance company that doesn't need to worry too much about their loss because uh, these catastrophe bond provisions will protect them from uh, severe losses. Income bonds and a com convertible bonds is also another important concept. So convertible bonds is a, like a combination of a bond plus a call option on a stock. So meaning that if, uh, so most bonds are not convertible, but convertible bonds are a special hey, case. So if you are buying a convertible bond, the meaning is that. Need to, the link uh, is going to be. You have the so right the next thing we need to, to do convert the bond the to framework the company stock at out. a certain um, price. So if you don't yeah, want to convert the bond to product. stock, you can you just let more. the conversion previ uh, provision lapse. But if stock price so goes so up, so then uh, you may regret, oh, I should have purchased so have the stock instead of bond. Right but if you purchase a convertible bond, Definitely, you can exercise the convert double uh, provision and you can uh, uh, get stock instead of bonds. So that's a convertible provision. Put bonds are similar, as a put bonds are, uh, is also a special case. So if you purchase a, put, a bond that has a put provision, you, you can, you have an option to sell, put the bond back to the company. So when market rates go up, Searching but still for the company and tools paying for your low uh, rate in a low coupon, small amount of coupon, then you can exercise the put option. So those are additional features. All right, any questions? Yeah, good, yeah, definitely. So convertible bond yield will be lower. You're getting it right, yes. So because convertible provision is good for investors, right? So investors would be willing to accept a lower return. We, we, investors would require lower return because of that attractive feature. So lower return, lower yield means higher price. So convertible bond will be more expensive than a regular bond. Good job, Philip. Thanks for your contribution. Any other questions, comments? So bond market, so the next slide is, is talking about bond market. So bond market, unlike stocks, bonds are traded usually over the counter. We don't see exchanges of bonds. And there are, so, so which one, which, which, which market is actually bigger in terms of number of securities? Definitely bond market has more security because uh, usually a company has a, a corporation has one stock. Some class, some companies has a different classes of stock, but it's rare. So usually each corporation has one stock, but how many bonds? A lot. So bond markets 
uh, has a lot more different securities, but we don't have that kind of exchange, like stock exchanges. So usually bond markets are dominated by large institutions and bonds are not traded very frequently. All right. Yes. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, higher. Uh, Oh, no, no, not lower market price. Yields lower means price will be higher. So yields and price move to the opposite direction. So convertible bond price will be higher because yield will be lower. All right. So bond markets usually are not, uh, uh, bonds are not usually traded uh, very actively, but one exception, treasury markets are different. Tre treasury markets and corporate bond markets are totally different. Treasury markets, US treasury markets, that's very active. A lot of participants uh, liquid every day because not only US investors, foreign governments, foreign uh, individual investors, institutions, always treasuries are different. So treasury markets are very active. So if you are interested in learning more about the market actual data, so Finlage Market Data Center website, so I provided a link or you can Google Finla. So website, that's a very good source of bond information. And the next slide shows how to read the treasury quotations. So we are looking at a uh, 2036 bond, this is when the bond uh, will be mature, meaning that this bond uh, principal will be paid back and the coupon rate is 4.5%. So that means usually treasury bonds, treasuries are semi-annual coupon paying. So every six months for 1,000 principal, uh, uh, half of $45, so $22.50 coupon will be paid for every $1,000 principal. And bid, ask, what does that mean? Bid is the, and treasuries are uh, traded in the dealer's market. Bid is what dealers uh, is willing to buy at. So dealer's purchase price is the bid price and dealer's sale price, sale price is the ask price. So always ask price should be higher than that bid price because the difference is dealer's profit. And what does this 128.0781 mean? This is a percent of par. So 128.0781% of the par value, 1,000, that's the price. And so this is how to read the quote. So change is the change based on previous trading days. What's the difference? So the change positive means price went up. And watch as the yield. Yield to maturity based on as the price. So yield to maturity is 2.618%. So yield 2.6%. Coupon rate 4.5%. Oh, yield is lower than coupon. So that means premium bond. So that's why bid and ask prices are above 100. So coupon rate, uh, maturity, Bid price, ask price, change, yield, ask yield. So I explained everything. So any questions so far? No? Okay, good. So inflation, we briefly, as we briefly mentioned, uh, all returns, yields, we see all rates, we see our nominal rates. So, but the actual purchasing power. So for example, if you are purchasing a bond yielding 4%, so it doesn't mean your pur purchasing power increases by 4%. Because if there is an inflation during the period of 2%, your purchasing power is not increasing as much because of the impact of inflation. So that's why how much purchasing power in, uh, increase I will get from this investment. You need to calculate the real rate of return after adjusting for expected inflation. So you use the Fisher effect equation. 
So one plus nominal rate is equal to one plus real rate multiplied by one plus expected inflation. So this is so kind of approximation is nominal rate has two components, real rate plus expected inflation. But as you can see, this is kind of a simple interest rate concept. So this is just an approximation. So to be accurate, you need to use this like multiplication instead of subtraction. It's based on compounding concepts. So one plus real rate multiplied by one plus in expected inflation gives you one plus nominal rate. So if you rearrange it, you need to use this equation to solve for convert nominal and real returns. And here are examples. So if you require 10% real return and expected real uh, re inflation is 8%, the nominal return should be 1 plus 10% multiplied by 1 plus 8%. So 18.8%, not 18%. So based on feature effect. effect. Any questions so far? So the next topic is term structure of interest rates. So, so the, this, uh, the remaining slides are about the relationship between yield and maturity. So term structure is the relationship between the remaining time until maturity and yield. So yield curve is the relationship that shows time. So in yield curve, the horizontal axis is the remaining time until maturity, time to maturity, and uh, yield is on the vertical axis. So usually yield curve is upward sloping, meaning that longer term bonds have a higher yield. So it's, a, it's a, like use your common sense. So you bring money to a to TCF bank and 10 year CD versus five year CD versus one month CD. Definitely five year CD will have a higher uh, rate than one month CD. So longer term uh, saving, longer term lending will should usually receive a higher yield. So treasury, uh, uh, yield curve is usually upward sloping. And there are three components. So real rate component and inflation premium and interest rate risk premium. You remember longer term bonds have a higher interest rate risk. So long-term uh, bond buyers are subject to more interest rate risk. So interest rate risk premium is built into, so that's why one, that's one of the reasons why Treasury yield curve are usually upward sloping. But not always. Sometimes, especially right before recession, yield curve may look uh, downward slipping, uh, downward sloping. So, but real, uh, it, so because of inflation premium lower. So, again, there are three components real rate, inflation premium, premium and interest rate. rate. Uh, risk premium, but yes, uh, during uh, uh, some unusual period, usually right before recession, yield curve may be downward sloping. And here are some examples, and there are some websites that you can find where you can find uh, yield curve data. So again, Finla's website is a very good source of bond and interest rate related information. So this is a summary of uh, like a what affects bond yield. So real return, expected inflation, and interest rate risk premium, and default risk, credit risk, bond ratings, and tax, like municipal bonds case, and liquidity. So as I mentioned, bond markets are not very liquid. So a lot of some bonds are not very liquid, then very liquid bonds price will be lower because of the inconvenience. So that means yield will be lower. That we call liquidity premium. So those are what's affecting, what may affect bond yield. So you should be able to know how to calculate bond price and yield. And 
bond prices fluctuate when interest rate changes. So it may be about company specific regions, issuer specific regions, or the overall economy, and indentured contract, and all important characteristics should be written there, and bond ratings, implications, credit quality, like AAA, triple B, those things you need to uh, remember. And term structures of interest rates is a relationship between maturity and yield. And a graphical illustration of this relationship is an yield, we call yield curve, the yield curve. So there are factors, there are many factors of affecting the required return on a bond, which is yield. So we just went over that concept. So we finished the chapter seven. So we finished all uh, chapters you need for the midterm exam that will be is scheduled for uh, one week from today. You are gonna have the in class. So let me. I posted this. So this guy, exam guidance, uh, I posted on Blackboard. So you must arrive at the Zoom meeting. So a, a couple of minutes only, that's better. And you need to have your attendance checked. And most students signed the honor pledge, so thank you. But there are a couple students who didn't sign honor pledge. So those students must sign the honor pledge. Otherwise, I'm not going to grade the Doge student exam until the Doge student sign the Anno Pledge. So sign the Anno Pledge, and then all those who signed the Anno Pledge attend the Zoom class, attendance checked in the waiting room, and then log in to connect as you usually do for uh, quizzes and same, same mechanism. One only difference is just you use uh, we use the entire class time, one hour, 15 minutes for the exam, and we are going to use Connect. And one another difference is there is some kind of questions. So most of questions are like a multiple choice using Connect, but there are three questions I ask you to write. So one question requires to write a few sentences on concepts. Don't write too much. So the length doesn't matter. As long as you have enough information clearly to answer my conceptual question, it's okay. So don't lie too long. Like two, three sentences should be enough if you understand that question clearly. So long questions with very few valid points will receive a lower grade than succinct, short, but well explained, clear answer. So don't write uh, too long Be because we, you only have 75 minutes, so we don't have time to write an essay. So it's, a, it's called, in co Connect College, it's an essay question. It's just a, for convenience, just, a, but I don't expect a many sentences. So a few sentences clearly written will be enough. And there are two questions that I, I ask you to show calculations. So you need to show, the steps, necessary steps to get to the answer. So if you skip important steps and numbers, uh, you will not get a full credit. So you should show the necessary steps. Uh, so those, there are two of those questions, all else like 17 questions, those are multiple choice. I know you we only have a 15 minute at 75 minutes so I cannot make the exam too long. So manage your time well but still we only have 20 questions but if you didn't practice well and if you spend the time the exam time for studying you will definitely uh, run out of time so practice enough. So 13 out of the, those 20 questions require calculation and seven are conceptual. You don't need uh, any calculations for those seven quest conceptual questions. And the same rule. So during the exam, so I'm, uh, I'm more, yeah, 
So there is no way I can prevent, I can block you to read your notes. So to make uh, the playing field even for everybody, you are allowed to use your notes and other information. But one thing you must, you are strictly prohibited from. No communication with others. So you must show your own work. It's okay to look at an equation or some notes you took using it uh, to answer my questions, that's okay. But you should never receive any help from other people. So you must show your own work. Yes, you should do you show your uh, calculation on two questions and one question is about you, your knowledge. You need to write uh, some sentences, not number. Okay. So any questions about the exam? And also another important thing is Zoom meeting. I, I created a special Zoom meeting link for this exam. The main reason is the, the, the October 14th follows each Wednesday, but it follows a Monday schedule. So if I am using one day or Wednesday meeting, Zoom meeting link, it will be too confusing for people. So I don't like any confusion during the exam. That's why I created this special midterm exam Zoom link. So you, and I wrote it in, the, in this review sheet as well as I posted on Blackboard. So you must use this special Zoom link for the midterm exam, October 14th. So don't go another meeting room. I will not be there. So use this specific Zoom link created for the midterm exam. And there are some topics. So let's be realistic. We have seven chapters and I can give you only 20 questions. So some questions, some chapters are more important than others. So there are some variations, but on average, I cannot ask you more than three questions. So some questions, some chapters have four or maybe five, other chapters have two or one, but on average, it's three questions from each chapter. And those are the most important uh, concepts. So I picked the most important concepts from those seven chapters and listed. So uh, you need to uh, be at least familiar with those core concepts. So if you are aiming at earning A plus, definitely there may, may be a little bit of deviation from here. So you, if you are aiming at earning A plus, definitely you need to know everything we covered. But that's not, if that's not the case, uh, if you are tied in prepar exam preparation in terms of time in preparing exams, so focus on these topics listed there. All right. So that's all I have. Uh, so this review topics. And also, so, Another important thing, you must meet the due date for homework assignment. So don't lose. So, so that's basically, I expect everyone. So on close to 100% homework because every, after every attempt, you can see the feedback and start over and you get the maximum grade. But I still see some students are not getting good grades on homeworks and that there is no excuse for that. So meet the deadline and then don't lose your points unnecessarily from homeworks. All right. And if you didn't do well in quizzes or homework problems, so look at the solution study. And if you need additional help, come to my office hour. So it's no, Connect does not always it takes the highest score on homeworks. Connect shows me actually everything. You will be surprised actually I, how much I can see from Connect. Connect is a very good software. Connect has some weakness, weakness so it has some problems. So I'm actually working on it. Actually, the publisher McGraw-Hill has a very good instructor support line. So I keep communicating with them to improve the software. but. 
connect is very good in terms of providing data. I can see when you started that homework, how much time you, uh, you spent there, and all the attempts you made. Uh, connect shows me everything. But as I explained on the syllabus, I'm going to take the highest. Uh, yeah, that's creepy. <laughs> that's a really, really creepy. But it helps, actually, because especially in this kind of online environment, that kind of information helps. I'm not going to use that creepy information against you. I'm, I'm just, so for example, if there are students, oh, because I started this quiz, but because of the internet issue, uh, I couldn't complete, can I do it again? But Connect showed this student never started. So I can see all that information. So to give a fair grade, I use this information, but I, I, that information is strictly within this learning system. I'm not going to disclose it again or use it against you. I will closely follow the syllabus and I'm going to take the highest score of all of your attempts. So don't worry about lower score in uh, homeworks. Okay, any other questions? All right, we have uh, three minutes. So if you have any questions, you stay. And uh, uh, so let me stop share this. So I will